Good evening and welcome to FPA Live. I am Ted Roosevelt, an investment banker at Barclays and a director of the Foreign Policy Association. I have the special privilege this evening to introduce our evening speaker, Professor Ruth Ben Giat. Ruth Ben Giat is a distinguished historian and a professor of Italian and history at NYU, and she is an expert on Italian history, fascism, authoritarianism, and propaganda. She is the author of seven books and many essays and op-eds in media outlets, including CNN, The New Yorker, and The Washington Post. In her latest book, Strong Men from Mussolini to the Present, she examines the authoritarian playbook illiberal, illiberal leaders have used for a century. This is an important and disturbing book as it shows how the autocratic playbook is the same whether for Mussolini, Hitler, Putin, Mobutu, Berlusconi, and a former US president. Leo Tolstoy wrote, there are no conditions to which a man may not become accustomed, particularly if he sees that they are accepted by those around him. For too many insular Americans, it was easy for them to implicitly accept a norm-destroying approach to politics. To do so makes us complicit in the destruction of essential norms that protect our democracy and civilization itself. Professor Ben uh, Giat, in her concluding paragraph writes, history shows the importance of keeping hope and faith in humanity and of supporting those who struggle for freedom in our own time. We should never forget this. Professor, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for that introduction. It's an honor to speak at the Foreign Policy Association, which has been such an important promoter uh, and custodian of American democratic values around the world. And the testimony uh, of US foreign policy officials, such as diplomats who served in the Congo and Libya and Chile, were among my most precious sources in writing my book. So ours is the age of the strong men. It's a term I use to denote authoritarian heads of state who damage or destroy democracy and use masculinity as a term, uh, as, a, as a tool of political legitimacy. Such rulers now govern Turkey, Brazil, Russia, and many other geopolitically important nations. Their dependence on corruption and disinformation, their neglect of the public good, and their refusable, refusal of accountability mean they handle national crises badly, with climate change likely to cause increased levels of disease and scarcity and the pandemic still raging. The spread of the strongman style of rule doesn't just endanger democracy, but can pose an existential threat. So I wanna start by talking about why I wrote this book. So first, as a historian, I was very concerned about the ongoing uh, revisionism by anti-democratic forces around the world that aims to whitewash both communist and right-wing authoritarian violence. So we have Putin who erects statues to Stalin, but sends historians who write about the gulags in the wrong way to prison. He's made it illegal to mention the Nazi Soviet pact. Bolsonaro in Brazil is among many who on the right who spread the idea that fascism was a left-wing movement and remained a left-wing movement in order to blame its violence on the left and leave the right with clean hands. In America, far-right groups entwine nostalgia for the legacy of state-sanctioned racism and violence from fascist regimes to the Confederate South to Cold War juntas. At a rally in September 2020, members of the Proud Boys wore t-shirts, so they had Confederate flags, but they also had t-shirts that proclaimed Pinochet did nothing wrong, uh, referring to the Chilean dictator. And I'll show you an image in a few minutes of that. Behind each of these talking points, and there are many more, are powerful information warfare strategies designed to produce the past 
that the right needs today, a past tailored to today's enemies of democracy. So to understand authoritarians, we need a historical and a global perspective. And strongman is my response to this dangerous situation. The current war on the truth and the rewriting of the history of states that disappeared bodies of information, as well as the bodies, the physical bodies of their enemies, prompted me to set the record straight using archival documents, uh, testimonies with survivors of regimes. I went to Santiago uh, to interview several people and myriad other sources. It is why I discuss the torture techniques of Pinochet and his Operation Condor allies in detail. It's why I take on cherished myths perpetuated by generations of authoritarians and their American PR firms, such as the idea that those leaders are omnipotent grand strategists and their states have been efficient and productive political systems. This is the uh, Mussolini made the trains run on time idea that's, that's uh, endured over a century for, for several countries. So my study highlights the chaos, the corruption, the violence, and the dysfunction that have characterized illiberal states. And we don't hear nearly enough, for example, about how the states of Erdogan in Turkey and Putin in Russia today function essentially as predatory entities. They seize billions of dollars of businesses and real estate and other assets. So we don't hear about that. We don't hear about this, the destructiveness for small business, the ruination of generations of, of, of family businesses built up over generations and the waste that comes when talented people are forced into exile or sent to jail. I also felt it was time to look back over the evolution of authoritarianism for a century, not least because the term remains surprisingly fuzzy in much of the political scientist literature. There's also confusion in the public sphere about what authoritarianism looks like today. And some of this confusion manifests in discussions uh, in our country about whether and how Trump might be a fascist. That's one example. We lack a common language to speak about the governments of the 21st century who come to power. The leaders come to power mostly through elections and then they find ways not to leave. They manipulate elections and other institutions of democracy to keep themselves in power. In 1997, in a landmark article for Foreign Affairs, Farid Zakaria coined the term illiberal democracy to refer to such states. But now Viktor Orban in Hungary has appropriated this term. And in my opinion, the democracy part of the illiberal democracy in his case is rather a sham since he now rules by decree, but it helps him to keep his funding by the EU. So I don't wanna use that term. I use the term new authoritarianism to refer to states uh, after that came after the Cold War 21st century states. And I make clear that it unfolds, authoritarianism unfolds differently in every country, including in America. I am not a specialist in American history and I felt this was an asset uh, in writing this book. I wanted to bring a global lens to bear on America um, to help, and I was writing as American who wanted to understand what was happening to us under Trump and to help the public understand. And I was among the first to warn that Trump would follow an authoritarian playbook based on my uh, studies of fascism. And I started writing about Trump in 2015 and that he would periodically use shock events. He would remake the federal bureaucracy. He would strike at the state. Um, and he would seek to realign America with the forces of global autocracy abroad. So Strongman is the first book to place Trump's presidency in the context of a century of authoritarian history. As such, it's intended as a warning bell that no country is immune in the right circumstances from the lure of leaders who appear on the scene and legitimize existing extremist and anti-democratic tendencies. And when I turned in the book in the summer, I didn't know what would happen with the election but I predicted that Trump would not leave office quietly. Those are the last words I write about him. And of course, 
we've seen what happened. January 6 brought that process to fruition. And it's the subsequent acceptance by the majority of the GOP of what happened has legitimized two central ideas of the strongman past and present. One, that violence can be a way to solve problems and move history forward. And two, that any means are legitimate to stay in office. So we've seen democracy is very much an honor system, but when you have uh, leaders like Trump who are not interested in, in codes of honor or even protocols that might mandate that you're supposed to leave office if you lose the election, we're in uncharted territory for America, but familiar territory for the authoritarian playbook. So what I call the authoritarian playbook provides continuity uh, through the book's three periods of strongman rule. Because I'm a historian, I really, I take a long time to situate uh, each ruler in his place and time. And I distinguish between the fascist era, the era of the military coups and the new authoritarianism post 1990s. Um, and the core of the book are chapters on the tools of rule, the playbook, propaganda, corruption, virility, violence, and the myth of national greatness. I explain how they mix utopia, the promise of a better future, but nostalgia is equally important for a lost grandeur. So it's never just making the nation great, it's about making the nation great again. So Mussolini had the Roman Empire, Erdogan talks about reviving the Ottoman Empire, and others who don't have an empire in their past, like Trump, it's a vague kind of uh, remaking the nation to when women and people of color knew their place, when things were better. So it's this mix of utopia and nostalgia is always in there. There are also chapters on resistance and how strongmen fall. And I add to discussions of authoritarianism by highlighting the importance of virility or machismo and how it works together with other tools of rule. Gaining a favor after periods of economic and political gain for women, the strongman seeks to reverse shifts in social norms that threaten patriarchy and normative concepts of masculinity. And this translates into state policies that target women and LBGTQ populations who are as much the strongman's enemies over a century as prosecutors and the press. Virility also enables the leader's corruption projecting the idea he is above laws that weaker men must obey. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And uh, show you some slides. And here is the Proud Boys rally, the Pinochet did nothing wrong, alongside the Confederate flag. Um, and this is the, the cult of virility with Mussolini being the first leader to strip off his shirt uh, on camera and Putin being another bookend for that. Um, Trump does not strip his own shirt off, but he, this is an original tweet. It's not even a retweet of himself as Rocky III where he photoshopped his face or someone did onto the body of Sylvester Stallone, but this kind of fighter image, machismo. And I really wanted to take it seriously. It's not just, uh, we can easily laugh at Putin with his pecs fishing in Siberia uh, or this, but it's, it can be deadly serious. And then machismo and male bonding also function uh, in the kind of personalized foreign policy that these leaders uh, pursue. And this is, I start the book with the relationship of Berlusconi and Putin, uh, which is a very interesting and complicated relationship. So I wanna talk about a few continuities that run through the book. Um, one of them is personalist rule. And this is a concept that comes from political science. Uh, it's very useful. It's a core concept in the book. Personalist rule concentrates a lot of power in one individual that's part of authoritarianism whose own political and financial interests prevail over national ones in formulating domestic and foreign policy. Loyalty to him and his allies rather than expertise, 
are the primary qualifications for serving in state bureaucracy and tolerating or enabling is corruption. If the leader or his inner circle are under investigation, and many of these strong men were already under investigation when they come to power, governance becomes all about self-defense with resources of, of the party and government kind of hijacked to exonerate and defend his person and, and punish those who can harm him, prosecutors, journalists, and political rivals. While I stay away from psychological analysis in the book, one thing that surprised me was how similar the personalities and temperaments of these leaders are, although the outcome, I make it very clear, the outcomes are quite different in the age of dictatorships versus today. Um, all of them use divide and rule practices to prevent anyone else from getting too much power. And this produces governments full of conflict and upheaval. Hitler was somewhat of an exception because he had his uh, key collaborators came to him early like Goebbels and Rudolf Hess, and he kept them for years. Most of the other rulers constantly rejiggered and, and was like a revolving door. Uh, in Mobutu's case, there were people who he fired, he, he had them tortured, and then they came back into government. And Mussolini revamped his government every four years. He also, Il Duce, started the practice of strategic pardons, where people are disgraced, and then they're pardoned so that this frees up the worst criminal elements of society to apply their skills on behalf of the leader. And Trump makes a lot of use of pardons as well. So there's a lot of chaos and dysfunction in uh, this systems of governance that they set up. And Gaddafi took this chaos to an extreme. Uh, this was his personality, repealing entire legal frameworks from, from one day to the next. But even Pinochet, who is supposed to be the stable military bureaucrat, he frequently reshuffled his cabinet. And today we have Erdogan, very unpredictable decision-making, which is worsened by him surrounding himself with family members and flatterers. And this is, this is typical. So of course, none of this um, chaos and waste is visible in the productions of strongman personality cults. And this is very interesting because the canons of these personality cults haven't really changed over a hundred years. Although of course the media used to present them to the people uh, is different today with social media. So one of those rules is that the leader must be a man of the people. He must be there as the voice of the people, acclaimed by the people. And yet he also is a man above all other men, often uh, ruling through divine mandate. And so this is uh, a typical poster. And so it, with you, we embrace greatness, which is supposedly the people, uh, uh, saying, you know, acclaiming Gaddafi. And yet he's looking toward the heavens because he, he often would stop in the middle of his speeches and look uh, upward as though he was receiving divine inspiration. And the idea that the strongman is there by some uh, uh, higher will is uh, a common for, for 100 years. And it's an irony of strongman history that it's often the most profane and impious or unpious individuals who have the most success at making effective deals with major religious institutions. From the atheist Mussolini, who uh, made peace with the Vatican and had the Lateran Accords, to Trump with evangelicals and Orthodox Jews. And he has delivered for, for both of these groups. So while strong men like to seem invincible, um, they also depend on their skill at mass communications. And it's very interesting that many of them come into uh, office or come on the scene already skilled in mass communications and they work very hard at their supposedly natural charisma. And uh, one of the big uh, parts of this is that from Mussolini's use of newsreels to Trump's use of Twitter before he was banned and Modi's use of Instagram, they have direct communications channels with their people. And this allows them to pose as a very different uh, relation with the nation than democratic uh, leaders with a small d. Because democratic leaders might uh, represent the people, but 
uh, strongman leaders embody the people. They personally inhabit and assume the burdens and the worries of the people. They become victims on half of the people. So personality cults, the cult of victimhood is essential to a strongman personality cult. So here is, this is an interesting, this is a Trump uh, painter, uh, John McNaughton, and this respect the, the flag, the occasion is the um, insult of the, the kneeling, the players, the NFL players kneeling uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to um, protest uh, police brutality. But what's of interest here is that Trump is personally stricken in a way that would imply he had empathy that I don't think he has that he is personally experiencing the affront and the injury of the nation. And so he's clutching this tattered flag. So that's, that's very, very important. The emotional uh, bond of the leader and the fact that he mirrors these emotions back to the people in ways that uh, democratic leaders uh, don't, don't often do. And they're also their ability to use, to bond with the people through their skill at mass communications uh, is also key in their personality cults. And at their peak, they are in, um, omnipotent, they are infallible. And this was the slogan, fascist Italy, Mussolini is always right, which uh, this was a building. You would see this as you drove uh, you know, through a major uh, road. Um, and here, and they were also uh, omnipresent. They are everywhere. And Modi, who has used Instagram very, very skillfully to tell his story and to have that direct communications channel with the people, he uses holograms so that he can appear simultaneously at rallies. And he's very, very savvy in the way he does this. So, so I talk about all of this, but the book is not just about the figure of the strongman, but about his relationship with his enablers and his grassroots followers. Because although they like to think they can do everything on their own, um, in truth, they're nothing without their enablers. And elites are the most important promoters and collaborators. And again and again, we see the same dynamic um, at strategic points where elites can be worried about losing their class privileges or their economic position or worried about socialist revolution, they bring these extremists into the system thinking that they can control them, that they can use them. Uh, and of course, uh, and this happened in Italy and Germany, uh, it happened of course the GOP with Trump and they strike an authoritarian bargain is the term for it in the political science literature that promises them power and prosperity in return for uh, you know, loyalty. And those who sign on, and this is a sad truth, uh, once they sign on, they tend to stick with the leader, whatever he does or says um, through mismanagement and even through insurrectionary behavior. So the latter part of the book is how all of this uh, can backfire. Uh, surrounded in his cocoon with craven subordinates and family members. I have a, a paragraph on sons-in-law uh, who are always in the mix. This reinforces his worst tendencies. Nobody who is in his inner circle and survives can tell him the truth. So his hubris, his paranoia, and his vengefulness are uh, increased. Nobody is, is being a check on him. And so over time, he comes to believe his own propaganda and makes bad decisions. And authoritarian history is full of projects and causes championed by the ruler out of pride or megalomania and implemented to disastrous effect. And so this brings us to how they can fall uh, in their very particular way from power because the authoritarian playbook doesn't have a chapter on failure, the ego needs uh, and actually the fear that these leaders have um, doesn't allow them to contemplate really that they might have to leave office. Um, they might be voted out, the horror of being voted out as happened to uh, Pinochet or the horror of being forced into exile as happened to Mobutu or Idi Amin. And democratic heads of state see departure from office as a chance to build, on their, le build their legacies basically. But authoritarians uh, regard the loss of adulation and power and immunity from prosecution uh, as an existential threat. 
And this is why they are they're very psychologically unprepared to leave office. And they often uh, engage in desperate measures when they realize that uh, their time might be up. Um, some of them start wars or they plan coups to stay there. Political scientists even have a name for this phenomenon, gambling for resurrection. You know, one big move, desperate move that's going to save everything. But most autocrats lose the wager. So if we look at what happened after the November election in America, this conformed uh, for me, uh, Trump's uh, conformity with authoritarian practices. And it was an uh, entirely fitting and really very logical outcome, everything that happened. He tried everything from, uh, he investigated a military insurrection uh, and General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, shut that down. He engaged, as you know, for months in electoral manipulation of the type that's already practiced in other countries. And then he did the big gamble of the January 6th. So he didn't wreck democracy and he didn't have time, he, but he has, he has offered America an extraordinary civics lesson because for four years, we witnessed the decline of transparency and accountability and many other things typical of illiberal states. And yet we remained an open society. So all of these dynamics that we saw and we read about in the newspapers, you know, unfolded. Whereas in other states, you read about them only from exiles or dissidents um, who often pay with their lives for their transparency. So we had large news outlets invested in uh, investigative teams to cover Trump's corruption. Fact checkers called out his lies in real time and whistleblowers became a common term. Um, there were many tell-all books, and this is how it was very, this what people deride as access journalism was very useful for me to track how this divide and rule and this kind of inner sanctum with the flatterers and the family members operated in similar ways as it did with other in other eras, really. So we have a public record of all of this. And, and this is in a way a Amer very American story that we had this uh, man of clear authoritarian aspirations who, who may come back. Uh, he's not, we're not done with him. His personality cult stronger than ever. And yet we voted him out. And so um, we can talk in the question and answer about the roadmap he left both of how to wreck democracy, but we also, uh, he left, uh, a roadmap in, in his, the fact he's gone, of how that uh, people can mobilize to defeat uh, a process, to interrupt a process of, of authoritarian capture. And so we can feel, uh, those of us who were, were uh, for the cause of democracy can feel very good because it's very rare that, that this happens, that somebody is voted out on the way to uh, authoritarian capture. And this is what happened in America. So this is a very American story. And I'll stop there. I'm Noel Latif, uh, president of the Foreign Policy Association. And I'd like to begin by asking you, Professor ben Giat, whether at some level educational systems are implicated in the rise of authoritarians. <clears throat> are democratic societies doing an adequate job of transmitting democratic values? Some of our earliest uh, US Supreme Court justices wrote children's books to explain our constitutional system of government. Uh, the 20th century jurist, learned hand, uh, warned in his spirit of liberty speech, if the fire dies in the hearts of people, there's no constitution or judge that can restore it. Oh, that's a wonderful haunting quote. <laughs> um, I think that we have been able uh, to take democracy for granted. Um, to a much greater extent, extent than countries that have had experiences of foreign occupation or dictatorship. And I think that uh, we've rested on our laurels in some ways. And uh, that whatever, uh, I think that old fashioned civics is not taught as much. 
And this is indeed a, a big problem. Uh, we're going to have to address that. Um, I also think that um, as has been done in parts of Italy and in Finland, I think that it's vital to integrate um, uh, anti-disinformation measures into uh, educational curriculums, teaching people how, teaching children and young people how to recognize disinformation, um, both written and visual. So I think we, this is, this is a wake up call in this regard. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice um, John Roberts uh, concurs with you. He's called for increased civics education, stating uh, that in our age when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides is even more vital, end of quote. Is propaganda slash disinformation in the age of social media especially dangerous to your way of thinking? It is. And um, so one of, for, uh, with that, one of the reasons I wanted to, um, to uh, have each chapter go over 100 years is that the reader can see what stays the same and what is different. And social media um, makes possible the acceleration of the classic principles of propaganda because propaganda works through repetition and ideally the same message with small variations, which is uh, the Nazis were, you know, excelled at this and saturation um, where all areas of society um, can, and, and this has to happen over and over again in real time. Right, and it's institutionalized in schools, et cetera. So what we give up today in synchronization, where you can have, when you have a one party state with only a state media, you can have that quote, perfect synchronization of messaging. So we don't have that in, in because many uh, autocrats keep a pocket of opposition. Uh, that's the 21st century formula, but social media allows this different disinformation to populate with astonishing rapidity and also take the forms of memes, take many, many different visual and written and sound forms. And so it's an autocrat's dream, really. It's been said that facts are the oxygen of democracy. Uh, without reliable information, the public cannot make informed decisions and hold politicians to account. Without commonly agreed upon facts, we cannot have reasoned debates is the undermining of the media and the concept of fake news a mainstay of the authoritarian's playbook? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that. Um, it's very strategic the way it's done. And in both in the fascist period and in 21st century, but basically any, any context except military coups, except coups, um, strong men have to come to up in the public eye. They have to run for office. Um, and the turning of the public against journalists starts very early on. It starts before they get into office, in part because they're corrupt and in part because if they are indeed have authoritarian tendencies, they want to create this fictional re reality, even if it just starts with their own personality cult. So by the time they get into office, if facts emerge that tarnish them or expose their corruption or that of their allies, the public will already be taught to, uh, the, the journalists will already be discredited, basically. So fake news is a very strategic and old, the, the, the slogan is new, but, the, but the, um, the, um, the point of it is very old and it's always to keep uh, the ruler from prosecution. And, and I, I can't emphasize how, uh, em how linked corruption and propaganda are. And this is, I added a corruption chapter when I realized that it, the corruption's the glue and you can, it's not only financial corruption, it's moral corruption, it's co-opting people, but uh, much of uh, propaganda, it, it's not only about getting people to adore you, it's about blocking entire fields of knowledge and facts that could harm you. According to Freedom House, since 2006, a total of 116 countries 
have seen a net decline in political rights and civil liberties. Uh, 68 countries during 2018 alone. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, authoritarianism is on the rise. In 2020, many governments dispensed with parliamentary oversight and checks and balances, uh, canceled or postponed elections, prohibited public protests, uh, curtailed freedom of expression, uh, and perpetuated, uh, as you just mentioned a moment ago, uh, corruption. Uh, you state in your book that authoritarians, because their guiding principle is self-interest, are not particularly good at resolving uh, public crises. Could the pandemic bring down authoritarians in favor of technocrats? It, it could some places. I mean, the most savvy, and they've had plenty of time to do this, uh, while I wrote the book, um, you know, Orban, so Orban, uh, he consolidated his power where he rules by decree during the, after the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, but he'd already been there for some time. So it's if it, the, the pandemic has allowed for all the reasons you said, uh, where, where things were ripe, uh, it's allowed uh, autocrats to exploit it. But we also see the opposite look. I mean, most analysis of the 2020 election uh, believe that Trump was hurt. He got more votes than in 2016, but uh, he was to some extent hurt by his uh, mismanagement of the coronavirus. And this is because public welfare is the farthest thing from these uh, leaders' minds. Um, and when the... Uh, pandemic first started, I was giving interviews and it was it would upset some people when I would say that Trump really didn't care if you live or die, because it's a very bleak thing to say. <laughs> and it doesn't go with our bipartisan notions of what a president is. Um, but the, Trump is, is he was not he's not interested in that his goals have never been that of uh, any uh, of, of American presidents of the past of either party. His goals are autocratic ones, which was to make money uh, for Trump organization. So he went off and golfed while people were dying um, because when he's golfing, he's promoting Trump properties. And that's what's, so his goal, if we think of it as his goals are very different, but this came back to haunt him. Um, and I think precisely because we don't have an autocratic tradition um, in, in America, and so it stood out, the callous of, callousness of it stood out more. Um, I'm gonna widen the aperture. Uh, uh, you, you, you state in the book, all crises are leadership tests that clarify the core values, character and governing style of rulers and their allies. Yet a public health emergency exposes with particular efficiency the cost of a perennial feature of autocratic rule, the repudiation of norms of transparency and accountability. Uh, and as you just said, the, you continue, the authoritarian's priority is not to save lives, but to maintain or expand his power. With climate change likely to cause increased levels of disease and scarcity, the spread of the strongman style of rule doesn't just endanger democracy, but also poses an existential threat. Should reinforcing norms of transparency and accountability be the highest priority for democracies? I, I think so, because uh, think, you know, what is, if you don't have transparency, you are able to have uh, your illicit finances um, covered up. You're able to have your corruption covered up. And it also, um, it's very important for trust and democracy go together. And, and transparency and trust uh, and, and clear communication, they are all part of the mix that helps democracy. Unfortunately, uh, strongman leaders not only are more successful when uh, populations are highly polarized and at each other's throats, right? So they want the horizontal bonds of society to be broken and the vertical ones of them and the people to be strengthened. Um, so they're not only um, 
into polarization, but they're also, uh, they want uh, their populations to feel discouraged, to feel like uh, they're never gonna know anything, to give up even trying. Um, one analyst said that Putin's job, Putin's goal is to make the search for the truth too exhausting. Um, and of course, also make it very dangerous uh, as we, we've seen from the high, the dozens and dozens of people who have been killed, whether journalists or anti-corruption reformers like Boris Nemtsov for trying to bring light and transparency onto things. So it's also psychological warfare. They want populations to be resigned. The essence of authoritarianism is to have people feel alienated, lonely, and hopeless. Uh, you state that for authoritarians, only some people are quote unquote, the people, and that populist rhetoric is bound by faith, uh, race and, and ethnicity rather than legal rights. Is populism an incubator for the illiberal evolution of democratic politics and for the uh, emergence of authoritarians? It can be, and I have a little bit of a different uh, take on populism, meaning um, I, in this book, um, I consider it, I'm using it mostly as a set of rhetorical strategies and an ideology, um, and, and rather than, uh, because not all authoritarians are populists. Um, not all of them even use, like Pinochet was not a populist. Francisco Franco was not a populist. So, but populism, is when they're uh, running for office versus coming to power through military coups or being military juntas. Populism is very, um, it's a real galvanizer. And uh, the rhetoric of populism is very uh, appealing to people. And what I've tried to do in my, uh, not only in the book, but subsequent uh, interviews as part of my civic education. I think all of us, if we're so inclined can do something and I've been trying to do this a whole, uh, civic education is show some of the hypocrisy uh, behind far right populist statements. For example, the whole anti globalist rhetoric, which is hugely appealing uh, in many places of the world. Uh, people mobilize against globalists. And of course, there's, uh, you know, a kind of uh, hidden or overt anti Semitism and all kinds of anti antis that go with anti globalism. But in fact, the, 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 the rulers, the leaders who are, uh, for example, Trump, uh, no one is more globalist than Trump. His whole business model was about licensing his uh, Trump name uh, and, uh, abroad. And even while he was in office, he and uh, Ivanka were collecting Chinese trademarks. He asked the Chinese to help him be elected. And as same with the whole thing with the Russians, no one is more globalist. And the same can be said as of a lot of the far right parties in uh, Europe who are accepting funding from Putin. Um, and they use populist rhetoric very carefully, uh, but it's always been uh, this kind of smoke screen. Um, and think about Putin too, um, who, who isn't really a populist, but uses some of the rhetoric and yet stores all of his illicitly owned, uh, earned cash in uh, offshore finance networks. That's what, what's more global than that. So I think one, effective uh, anti-propaganda technique is to show up the hypocrisies, uh, po poke the holes in the slogans that are so appealing to so many. I was surprised by your observation about elites. Uh, you state, uh, quote, elites are the authoritarians most important promoters and collaborators. Can you elaborate on what you call the authoritarian bargain? Yeah, um, it, I saw over and over again that um, it was, I mean, most the, the most famous cases are in Italy and Germany where conservative elites worried about the rise of the left or, or simply uh, their own privileges in a broader way um, invited uh, Mussolini was invited in by the king to become prime minister and Hitler was famously, uh, you know, enabled uh, to come into office. Um, and so those are, those are political elites, but 
strongmen uh, depend on the broader collaboration of business elites, of financial elites, uh, and religious elites, which I mentioned before. That's, that's very important. Uh, the religious elites, of course, very important in connecting with the grassroots followers. And I also point out in the book the categories of foreign elites that have always enabled strongmen, because part of the project of the book is not only to show people how uh, authoritarianism has changed and how it works today, but also the through lines. So you have, you know, most, uh, most authoritarians have been propped up by mountains of foreign debt. So you have foreign, you know, banks and international law firms, and of course, public relations firms. Uh, and so I talk about even Francisco Franco uh, was very sad. One of the reasons he stayed in office so long is he was extremely savvy at rehabilitating himself, uh, getting rid of the taint of fascism and becoming a Cold War client. And he hired uh, a, a whole phalanx of uh, American PR firms and what you today call influencers, uh, including people in the travel industry, Conrad Hilton, Eugene Fodor, these are famous names of travel and hospitality to remarket uh, Spain as a stable place, good for investment and good for tourism. So these are, uh, these are also elites. Um, and the ones who had the most longevity in a way have been, were the savviest about using both foreign and domestic elites to sustain themselves in power. Could you talk about your observation that strongmen do not vanish with their exits from power, but instead remain as traces within the body politic? Yeah, um, this, is, this is an observation. Um, it's, it that's, it's, could have, of course, been a whole separate book, and there are many books about this. Um, but how, how it can be everything from when you had a real, uh, obviously a real dictatorship that lasted a while, how difficult it can be to uh, shed the traces of uh, their rituals, of their personality cult, and of course the trauma, if you were, uh, if you fell afoul of the regime as millions did, you carry the trauma in your mind, in your body. But I give an example of, uh, and, and Hitler, you know, that, that regime didn't last that long, but it was very obviously intense. So I give an example of a museum director who remembered that his parents, uh, when his parents would go for their Sunday walk, his mother would hold his father's hand in case he reflexively did the Heil Hitler salute. So that's, so these things get imprinted in the body. So there's that. And there's also uh, personality cults and the examples of, 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 example of Berlusconi is very good because he didn't wreck democracy, but he exerted a personalist rule. And he had, because he owned TV networks, he had a huge you know, personality cult. And although he had scandal after scandal and he was forced to resign because of the sex scandal with underage girls and the Eurozone crisis, his personality cult remained. <laughs> and even when he was banned from running for office for five years, his cult remained. Um, so it's a, it's a cautionary tale even for, uh, places that remain democratic that vote out their leaders. And so I had predicted some people uh, after Trump lost the election were saying he'd be washed up. We wouldn't really hear about him anymore and the GOP's support of him would fragment. And I, I never thought that was going to happen. Um, and I wrote an op-ed for the LA Times in November about his personality cult saying that it would last because that's, that's what happens. Um, so they, in some cases, they can last for, for decades. Um. In, in speaking uh, to the management of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, William Hazeltine uh, uh, underscores uh, the importance of social solidarity. Uh, governments, he says, no matter how competent, uh, cannot manage a national disaster without the cooperation of their citizens. Uh, you conclude your book with a quote from a, a young Italian filmmaker uh, mm. who said in 1941, uh, quote, the absence of love brought many tragedies that might have been averted. Uh, instead of love, 
a black cloak of indifference fell upon the people. And thus people have lost the eyes of love and can no longer see clearly. Here are the origins of disintegration of all values and the destruction and sterilization of conscience. Uh, is it cliche to say, uh, is, is coming together the answer? Yeah, I, I wanted to end. I mean, the book uh, has, I, I, I tried to infuse a dark sense of humor throughout the book, but it's obviously has many grim um, things in it. And I felt it was really important to end on an optimistic note that also that coming together and this um, ideas of love and solidarity are not just Pollyannish or, or dreaming, but they've actually been effective. And they've been effective, uh, they've been galvanizers of mass nonviolent protest around the world. Um, and in the chapter on resistance, I show how important that's been uh, at the right moment too. I mean, famously the fall of communism, and even when it didn't lead to success, like in Hong Kong or uh, in Russia against Putin, it, it's been very important for democracy movements. And this is, and love and solidarity are one of the things that that um, that give people hope. And so this goes back to it's very very important to uh, to keep those sense of uh, civil, civic society and horizontal bonds because once you once you fall prey to mistrusting each other and you, you lose your empathy, which is what authoritarians want. They teach us to hate each other, to, to be suspicious. They, they make people into categories that you're not supposed to uh, like or engage with, or you have to inform on your own family at its most uh, developed. Uh, and this, this keeps going today in North Korea. They split families, communities, churches. Um, so I wanted to really emphasize uh, the importance of love. A civic, it can be a civic love. Um, and I think that going forth, we, we, we need to really uh, practice this love for democracy. We've been able to, again, take it for granted to some extent. And I think we'll have to uh, build democracy protection as citizens into our routines, uh, as well as um, advocate for it to be uh, part of our curricula in schools um, and in community groups. We can't do some of this right now because the, because the pandemic limits our in-person gatherings, but there's much that can be done uh, virtually. Professor Ruth Ben-Ghiat, I wanna thank you for joining us today to talk about your thought-provoking book, Strongmen. Mussolini to the present. Ted Roosevelt, thank you for presiding uh, over this session of FPLI.